Okay, so at this time I'd like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Mahesh Ramshandani, who's gonna give you a talk on, on uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. Okay, thank you, Ross, and welcome to all of you. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, so we're going to spend 20 minutes or so talking about coronary bypass, not how to do it, the technical aspects of it, I think we discussed with most of you uh, in the lab yesterday, but talk mainly about the evidence and some trials. So the first uh, successful, first survivor from coronary bypass was done here at Houston Methodist in 1964. Dr. Garrett uh, DeBakey and Dr. Howell, all three uh, sadly have passed on. The first uh, Lima to the LAD was done in 1964 in Russia by Kolosov, and incidentally he used an anastomotic device for that. Another story, but it's interesting to note that the Russians were so far ahead. Um, Cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, really uh, the the development of it in the early 1950s by James Gibbon with a grant from um, AT&T uh, really set everything rolling. Um, and geography by Mason Sones in 1958 at the Cleveland Clinic, selective coronary angiography uh, uh, also was an important advance. He was actually trying to do an aortic root injection and accidentally cannulated the right coronary artery and in fact gave a power injection the patient um, um, coded, was revived, and he got great pictures of the right coronary artery, and, and, he, and he figured that there was something in it. <clears throat> uh, um, cardioplegia was developed in the, in the 70s uh, in the UK by, uh, by, by Mark Brainbridge at St. Thomas's and Brechneider in Germany, and variations of those solutions are still being used today. An off-pump cabbage developed in the 1990s with minimally invasive cabbage coming on in the 2000s. I won't spend too much time talking about the different varieties of cabbage. We might touch a little bit on, a little bit on off cab. So the evidence for cabbage is based in three large trials. So I'm gonna go over all the basics because it's important that you should have this foundation. Um, and they were conducted in the 70s and the 80s and they compared cabbage to medical therapy. Less than 10% of patients received a lima graft, okay? And medical therapy, of course, is not what it wa was not then what it is today, which is aggressive risk factor modification that you're all familiar with. The three trials that I'm referring to are the coronary artery surgery study, the VA study, and the European coronary surgery study. Each of these looked at uh, patients with triple vessel disease, uh, in the case of CAS uh, uh, with depressed EF, um, and uh, also in the case of the VA study. All three of them showed that in patients who had advanced coronary disease with depressed left ventricular function, cabbage was far superior to medical therapy. Now, in 1994, Dr. Yusuf uh, wrote a very nice review in The Lancet. It's now about 25 years old, but still well worth reading because it uh, encapsulates all of the evidence from seven randomized controlled tri trials of cabbage versus medical therapy up, up to that point and showed that cabbage improved survival and symptoms <clears throat> and the benefits were most seen in patients with advanced uh, triple vessel disease, left main stenosis, yes please, left main stenosis and a bad left ventricle. Now, the benefits of cabbage were underestimated for severe disease because most patients who were enrolled in these trials were low risk patients. The results were analyzed on an intention to treat basis, uh, but 40% of the medical patients crossed over into cabbage because of persistent symptoms or for whatever reason, and only 10% received an internal mammary artery. In spite of this, there was a strong advantage shown for cabbage over medical therapy. There was no survival benefit shown for patients with normal left ventricles uh, or single and double vessel uh, coronary disease unless it was a proximal LAD lesion, thank you. <clears throat> so the recommendations for future trials were that um, they should include a higher proportion of patients for whom cabbage is known to be superior to medical therapy. In other words, sicker patients need to be enrolled more frequently in these trials. Okay. Now the major morbidity of cabbage comes from is, is, is stroke, which is multifactorial. It could be due to the heart-lung machine, the aorta, pre-existing cerebrovascular disease, myocardial infarction, which is what you're trying to prevent, is one of the complications of coronary bypass surgery, and of course lung complications, kidney complications. And you can calculate the specific risks by using the STS risk calculator. All you have to do is Google STS risk calculator, and the top hit that comes up is that template. It takes about five minutes to enter all of the patient data that's required and it'll spit out numbers at you. What's the mortality risk for that patient? What's the risk of renal failure, prolonged ventilation, and so on and so forth. 
Um, there's over 1.5 million patients in the STS database. And the overall mortality in this group is about 2% for all comers and 0.5% for the lowest risk group, which is actually astonishing when you consider the complexity of this operation. <coughs> Cabbage has evolved in other ways as well. Various conduits have been used, both internal mammary arteries, the saphenous vein graft, the radial artery, even the gastroepiploic artery, although this has now fallen uh, out of use, uh, uh, except by a very, very small number of surgeons worldwide. On-pump cabbage, off-pump cabbage, minimally invasive techniques, um, and hybrid philosophies, which combine a minimally invasive uh, strategy of placing the lima on the LED and PCI for for the other vessels. We don't know if this is a viable strategy moving forward, and it's currently being studied. So PCI has evolved greatly since the first report in 1979 when Grunzik described in that famous article in the New England Journal uh, his report of doing a balloon angioplasty of somebody who had a significant LED lesion. And of course, all of you are familiar with the evolution through bare metal stents and drug-eluting stents, and PCI claims equivalence to cabbage uh, using the same um, rationale uh, that cabbage used over medical therapy, and, and, and therefore claims parallel benefit over medical therapy. But a, a, a trial in the New England Journal in 2007 which compared PCI versus modern optimal medical therapy, uh, uh, almost 2,500 patients, uh, showed that there was no difference in death or myocardial infarction up to seven years. But, and this is important to note, PCI was better at relieving angina, uh, but not myocardial infarction or death. So it's good for symptoms, uh, but it doesn't have the same power that cabbage has in improving survival. Uh, the Freedom Trial in 2012 uh, looked at cabbage versus PCI in diabetics. Um, a large number were screened, as you see, and about 10% were deemed to be eligible, and only 1,900, a 6% of patients who were screened uh, out of, which is almost 3,000, uh, sorry, 34,000 patients were actually enrolled. So when you see numbers like that, it always casts into doubt the external validity of any particular trial. And we'll contrast that with the syntax trial in just a moment. <coughs> um, the mean syntax score was 26, which is in the intermediate range, as you'll see. And basically, they showed that um, all-cause death, uh, myocardial infarction or revascularization was lower in cabbage, but strokes were higher with cabbage. These are trials. All the trials that I put in the talk today are important trials for you to take note of. Very difficult to go into the details over here except to skim over them, but they are important for you to look into. And there's about seven or eight of them, so it's not that many, maybe 10 altogether. The syntax trial, which is probably the most important contemporary trial that you need to be familiar with, the five-year results were published uh, in, uh, in uh, 2013. This was a randomized controlled trial of drug-eluting stents versus cabbage that was in 85 centers in Europe and the US, all comers to mimic the real world, <clears throat> uh, almost 4,500 patients were screened, and as astonishing 71% of these patients were enrolled, which is an incredible figure. There's almost no other randomized controlled trial which has, ha which has had such a high enrollment rate. And of course, what this means is that it increases the external validity of the trial or the applicability of the results to the real world. Um, Half went to cabbage and half to PCI. 15% of the cabbages were done as off-pump cases. This was left up to the discretion of the surgeon, and the rest were enrolled in a registry. And importantly, all of these patients were screened by a heart team. This was the first time that a concept of a heart team had been introduced in the context of a trial and was formalized. Um, and this has become actually an important component of the way we practice uh, uh, um, uh, today. It looked at a composite endpoint, <clears throat> and another major contribution of syntax was that they figured out a way to assess the complexity of coronary artery disease by assigning a numerical value to it called the syntax score. And that's what it looks like. Basically, you have this map, and you have a number assigned to uh, an area in each specific vessel, and what you then do is you look at an angiogram and you sit down and you score the patient. 
So a patient who has very diffuse disease, very diffuse triple vessel disease, will have a high syntax score, and somebody who has focal lesions but doesn't have much in the way of diffuse disease will have a low syntax score. And what they showed was that in all comers, um, in the blue line, you were much more likely to survive out to five years if you had cabbage uh, versus PCI in the yellow line. Uh, but this difference was more or less eliminated, not completely, in patients who had low syntax scores. So for the first time, we're beginning to parse the differences between patients with triple vessel disease and show that if you have a low syntax score, in other words, focal lesions that can be treated by PCI without further disease downstream, you may have outcomes that are similar up to five years. In the high tercials, patients who had very severe diffuse disease, cabbage was far superior than in the entire cohort. And um, um, a follow-up study which, was, uh, uh, which looked at a cause of death analysis in the syntax uh, trial that was published uh, two years ago in JAK, uh, showed, and if, you, and if you pay attention here to the, to the green part, that the, um, uh, that the cause of death from myocardial infarction, which is the green section of this pie diagram, was much higher in patients who had PCI than in those who had cabbage. Now, two or three slides on op-cab versus on-cab. <clears throat> Don't have time to discuss it much over here. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are only three randomized trials out there. One is the coronary trial, the other is GOPCAB, which was the German OPCAB trial, and the other is RUBY, which was a trial conducted in the United States at various veterans um, uh, affairs hospitals. The coronary trial has results up to five years, GOPCAB has one year results, um, and these were all, in these two trials, there were experienced surgeons, um, in the coronary trial, uh, you needed to have at least two years of experience in 100 cases of OPCAB as a minimum. And in the German study, you needed to have done at least 300, uh, approximately 300 cases. Uh, the patients were older, more urgent cases, more diabetes, and OPCAB was shown to be as good as ONCAB. Ruby, you had less experienced surgeons, uh, and there were attendings and residents who were operating over here, and, uh, and, and they showed that OPCAB was significantly worse um, at, uh, at three years. This uh, was a, uh, an institutional registry study which looked at approximately 13,000 patients um, um, over, over an 11-year period um, at Emory. Approximately 52% of them were done on pump and 48% were done off pump. And they showed that as the risk profile of the patient increased, uh, OPCAB disproportionately benefited them more. So in other words, if your STS risk was greater than three because you had bad kidneys, bad lungs, dementia, whatever, you were much more likely to do better with OPCAB as long as it was done by somebody who knew how to do it well. So the evidence shows that OPCAB done well is as good as ONCAB, and um, higher risk patients do better with OPCAB uh, with a high STS risk over the porcelain aorta. In order to do it well, you need to do it in low-risk patients so that it, 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 it is a routine procedure for you, or send high-risk patients to an experienced OPCAB surgeon. There are various registry data as well which show the superiority of coronary bypass surgery over stenting, and this one from New York is just one of many that are out there. <clears throat> so why is cabbage better than PCI? Well, PCI treats an isolated lesion in the proximal vessel. The complexity of the lesion affects the outcome. Cabbage bypasses the proximal two-thirds of the vessel where the current lesion um, and future threatening lesions occur. So the complexity of the lesion is irrelevant, and this advantage of cabbage will persist even if stent restenosis is zero. <clears throat> now, a word about the lemur. Uh, the influence of the lemur on 10-year survival uh, was first pointed out by Fred Loop at the Cleveland Clinic in uh, in 1986 in this classic article, and um, in 2009, a follow-up study at the Cleveland Clinic where they looked at um, about 4,500 patients who had had previous coronary bypass surgery and who came back with symptoms showed that if the patient had a patent left internal mammary artery, um, whether you did a redo surgery or whether you put stents or you treated them with medical therapy, you did not affect survival. 
So the lemur was what was the key ingredient to survival. You may impact symptoms, but you wouldn't have any impact on survival. We don't know why it's protected from atherosclerosis. It's used in about 97% of coronary bypass operations today. <clears throat> we also know that vein grafts aren't that great, and uh, the patency rates for vein grafts vary in different studies. This, this was one of the worst patencies that was demonstrated in the PREVENT study, where there was about a 25% failure rate at one year. Uh, but most other studies that have looked angiographically at vein graft patency uh, have shown uh, failure rates of anywhere between 10 and 20 percent at one year, which is not that great, and certainly not as good as stents, which are constantly evolving, and stents properly deployed um, will have patency rates at one year that are far superior to vein grafts, as long as they're used for appropriate lesions done by experienced operators and properly deployed. So stent failure has become increase, increasingly uncommon and is probably going to plateau out at a certain low level. There's never going to be a point where stents will not fail. But if you're looking at a 2% failure rate at one year, that's much better than main grafts can achieve as long as the stents are deployed in appropriate focal lesions. So ongoing trials may better refine the role of intervention for stable ischemic heart disease and the FAME 3 trial and the ischemia trial. I mentioned these only for you to Google them and look them up on clinicaltrials.gov because you will see what the trial design is and it will give you an idea as to what the endpoints are that they're trying to establish. These are ongoing trials. Uh, the ischemia trial is being funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute at a, at a cost of a whopping $100 million. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's being done in many countries around the world. And in fact, there's a great deal of doubt as to whether it is actually going to produce an answer for us. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, a good way for you to get a review of uh, the pertinent literature that surrounds the treatment of ischemic heart disease is to read the guidelines. And the most recent guidelines that are available are the European Society guidelines that were published in 2014. The American Heart Association SDS guidelines were most recently published in 2012. You can look it up online very easily. Go to any of those websites. Slide sets are available for you to download. But importantly, when you download the entire manuscript of this particular guideline, the reference section will list every single important study that you need to be aware of uh, to, uh, that, 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 that provides the evidence for these guidelines. The heart team concept, <clears throat> which was initially proposed in the context of the syntax trial for coronary disease, is still more a concept than reality in most centers. <clears throat> Almost two-thirds of patients are not aware of alternative revascularization strategies. The ratio of PCI to cabbage varies greatly in Europe from 2 to 8.6. In New York State, one study showed that 53% of patients eligible for coronary bypass surgery um, um, got it uh, if it was left up to the interventional cardiologist alone. In other words, more than uh, or approximately half um, of the number of patients who would have benefited more from coronary bypass surgery based on the available evidence would get PCI if the decision was left up solely to the interventional cardiologist. At our institution, we have uh, ischemic heart disease conferences twice, um, um, uh, twice a month, and, uh, and it never ceases to amaze me how we can have uh, uh, um, differences, never violent, but sometimes close to violent differences over seemingly straightforward cases. Um, so I think the future for the treatment of coronary disease is a multidisciplinary approach like cancer. Uh, you, you, you really cannot go to any institution of note today and find a patient with cancer being treated by one individual. It's about disease management. It's about patients, not procedures. The syntax score <clears throat> is a major contribution. The role of hybrid procedures is as yet undefined. The heart team approach is critical, I think, uh, for the proper management of these patients. And it's important to know that there is still a lot of gray areas in decision-making for coronary disease. Thank you.